Welcome to today's Postgres World Webinar, PostgreSQL Lock Management Beyond the Deadlock. We're joined by Greg Dostotny, DBA at Command Prompt, who will discuss pitfalls and solutions to the lock manager challenges related to large, high-performance environments. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres Conference organizers, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. So Greg's an experienced IT professional with over 20 years of experience in higher education. He started off as a developer working on software to manage search and rescue incidents and also crowd urban crowd movement simulations, which is something I wanna learn more about Greg. Um, he has a background as a DBA systems admin working with Oracle and Postgres and Solaris and Linux. And Greg's also committed to using technology to solve problems both at home and in the professional setting. So welcome, Greg. And I think that's it from me. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off. So take it away, Greg. Uh, so my name is Greg Dostatny, and I work as a, a database administrator for Command Prompt. And I wanted to do a talk about PostgreSQL log management. Um, so first, what I'd like to do is uh, describe the scope. Um, there's lots of uh, presentations and there's a lot of articles about Postgres Log Manager. It's a big topic with uh, different scopes. Uh, you can talk about the uh, different types of regular logs. You can talk about the Log Manager itself, like we'll be doing. You can talk about lightweight logs. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, different sections that you can pick and choose. Unfortunately, all of it tends to be called log manager. Uh, for this presentation, we'll be we'll be obviously talking about Postgres database. Um, so we're focused on the uh, the management of logs specifically. Uh, we're talking about the the internals of the log manager to to some extent. I'm not a developer. I have read the uh, a lot of the source code. I'm not an expert, but uh, we're focused on the mechanism by which Postgres is uh, managing logs and how it can um, how it can go wrong. Uh, we will be including case studies because I always find it more interesting to to see uh, to learn about what happened and what went wrong. And we will very specifically not be talking about deadlocks. Uh, they're important, but from the point of view of scope of this presentation, deadlock is just a database doing its normal thing. Um, when a multiple queries come in and they, they get themselves into a deadlock, it gets resolved, life moves on. Uh, everything uh, for the most part works the way it should. Um, all right, I think that's that's about it on the, on this slide for the for the scope. So we're going to start, unfortunately, with a bit of a background. Uh, so please bear with me. We're going we'll need to cover some basics as to why locks exist. Really, uh, there will not be a surprise quiz at the end. Uh, I can promise you that, mostly because well, this is a webinar. And two, since I've mentioned it, it wouldn't be a surprise. So let's uh, let's start with some real basics. Uh, this, so what are locks and what are they used for? Locks is basically one of the uh, mechanisms for a uh, process to access uh, a process or a system to access a shared resource. There's many other mechanisms, as, as we'll go over here very briefly. One of the sim in a in a order of complexity, one of the simplest is uh, mutex, which stands for mutual exclusion. Uh, all it means is that there is a critical section of code, and only one entrant, uh, one thread, can access it at any given time. So that's very very straightforward. Uh, on top of that, you can build a semaphore which basically uh, works like a mutex, except that it allows a certain number of, of threads in a, in a process, uh, in, in, a, in a critical, critical section. 
So it just counts and makes sure that uh, um, only a certain amount maximum is allowed. Next, we're going into the meat of our presentation, which is the locks themselves. Lock is um, uh, basically it's a, um, a thread is allowed to take out a lock on a on a shared resource. It could be a table or an index or um, a file file descriptor, um, and it's uh, a given process. It's taking out a lock with a given capabilities. So you can say, I need this resource to be able to read from it, or I need this resource to be able to write to it, or, or to make uh, structural changes. So this is where uh, all the locks in Postgres uh, live. Um, just to move on uh, to a little bit more complex uh, methods, we have a barrier which allows for synchronized access. You can think of it from the point of view of a um, um, uh, parallel workers. When you're executing query with parallel workers, uh, they all need to complete before you can uh, take the results and sort them, as, as an example. So this step acts like a natural barrier where uh, everything has to complete before you can move on to the next step. And the last one is a monitor, which is Basically, everything go anything goes. Uh, it includes very complex behaviors, um, uh, capabilities like being able to take uh, take away a lock from a thread, put it somewhere else to make sure that the work continues. Um, in my view, the entire Postgres database can be viewed as at least as having some aspects of a monitor because a lot of these functionality do happen where logs get moved around, uh, not just by the thread that requests and owns them, by, but by others. So we cannot really talk about logs without talking about a multi-version concurrency control in Postgres. Um, so uh, I assume that most people aren't that familiar with uh, multi-version concurrency control, and it is a big topic. So, so we're going to go a little bit into that. Uh, what it is, it's basically a copy and write. Uh, when a tuple is changed, or when a bit of data uh, information in a, in a Postgres table is changed, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really get changed. A new, a new copy is created. Uh, this allows for, um, for uh, things like um, uh, an existing uh, an existing um, transaction that started before the uh, the change has occurred is able to still access the old version of the row. That gives it uh, that gives the uh, every tr every single transaction gives it a consistent view of the database as of the time where when the transaction has started, which is great for consistency. Uh, it is also great for concurrency because locking becomes very um, optimistic, um, which means that you don't expect to see a lot of locks. Um, a new object gets created whenever it's uh, it's modified, so it doesn't really need to need to be locked anymore. Um, if you have a, a lot of readers on a given uh, on a given piece of uh, a resource, um, creating a new one doesn't invalidate any of the readers and those readers can still continue because their transaction uh, began before the change and any new transaction will see the new row. And so it's, it's also great for, cons as we mentioned, for consistency and for isolation. Every thread, uh, every transaction appears to work in its own personal copy of the database. and the uh, conflicts are rare. From the implementation perspective, it means we have row versioning. Uh, there can be multiple versions of the same row in a table at the same time. And obviously each transaction has to be able to see just the, the row that is meant for it, not anything else. So the visibility rules are a little bit more complex and there's obviously overhead in trying to figure out uh, which row is visible by uh, by which uh, transaction. 
um, some considerations that come from this, uh, this approach. One is you have bloat. Bloat is nothing more than the old versions of, the, of these rows hanging around. Uh, they will be hanging around until uh, the last transaction that can reference them has gone away and uh, um, until after there's some kind of a maintenance process that can go and clean them up. Uh, the other, the other uh, consideration is a transaction ID wraparound. Postgres is keeping track of uh, transactions by giving a unique number. Uh, it's a 32-bit integer. Uh, in reality, you have about 2 billion transactions maximum. If you, um, if you have a, a single transaction that has been around for 2 billion, has been, has been kept alive for 2 billion of transactions that came after it, then you, bet you have what's called a wraparound. What it really means is that Postgres no, long, no longer knows what is past and what is future. Um, and data is, isn't really gone, but there is no real good way of getting to it anymore. So that's obviously something that uh, uh, needs to be avoided and Postgres will actually go into a, an emergency mode to uh, not ever um, reach that. And then all of this, uh, um, all of this mechanism has a big uh, effect on performance, obviously, because it's it, it's it's a lot of uh, um, it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of complexity. But it's both good and bad. Uh, on one hand, you have a lot of um, complexity in rules and figuring out visibility and uh, bloat potential bloat. But on the other hand, you allow uh, many, many processes to access the same database and read and write to it at the same time without, um, without causing a lot of, um, a lot of con uh, congestion. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the types of logs. Uh, so this is one of the the, uh, the main confusions that come from um, other articles and other uh, presentations. Not that they're they're confused. It's just that when you're trying to research this topic, there's a lot of different ways uh, you, the information can be presented and a given slice. So this is more of like an overview. So on one hand, you we can start with regular logs. These are um, what's typically dis discussed, and it is uh, basically the logs that we, we typically know. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's basically uh, one process, one transaction in the database is taking out a log on a given database object, be it a table or an index, a row. Um, on top of regular logs, you have something called SI read logs. That is typically viewed as a complex um, a scenario. It's not often used, but it is actually not that that difficult. Um, all it is, all uh, SI stands for uh, serialization or uh, uh, serial isolation. And what it means is that the transactions are guaranteed to execute in first come, first serve order. Think about a um, um, a webinar with a fixed number of seats, or maybe a strict SLA show. When you have the show empty at the beginning, you have uh, maybe a couple hundred seats. Everybody can come in and, and grab their seats uh, and or and buy their tickets. As you get to a small number, you may want to enforce a very strict um, rule saying that um, um, it's who, who, uh, first come, first serve, basically. Uh, so uh, a transaction will only succeed if uh, uh, you can only purchase a ticket if everybody else before has already been served and you're, you're the next in line. So that's what this, uh, this, uh, these types of logs enforce. And um, it's basically just tracking, uh, it's the regular logs which tracking the transaction, uh, transaction ID. Next, we have lightweight logs. 
Uh, we'll be talking about those in this presentation as well. And lightweight logs are basically, uh, instead of locking a database object, we are locking the memory structure. We don't control, as a DBA or as a user, we don't control lightweight logs uh, directly. They are used by one part of Postgres to talk to another part or to control a memory structure or to control access to the, uh, to the wall table or to, to, the wall, to the wall file or to the buffer or to the buffers. So it's, it's basically one bit of Postgres talking to another bit and making sure that the shared resource, again, is, uh, is controlled and accessed uh, appropriately. And the last one, which we will not cover because they're really not easy to see, are uh, spin logs. Uh, spin logs are extremely short-lived logs, um, and it's basically a thread is uh, spinning its wheels waiting for a log. Um, they're meant to, they're, they're almost always extremely short-lived, um, and they will not, um, the, the thread basically doesn't give out control. When you're waiting, when we're waiting, when a thread is waiting for a lightweight log, it will actually go to sleep, and it will give up CPU. It doesn't take up any CPU cycle. Something else can work in that place. Spin logs, kind of similar, but the thread is not releasing control. It's just spinning its wheels and waiting for the uh, uh, waiting for the log to be released. Log types and interactions. So these are regular logs. Uh, this table is directly from the documentation. Um, the, mo the most important thing that I would say if you're reading this uh, documentation is that if you see an X, that means there's a conflict. So if you have an existing shared log and you're trying to take a row exclusive log, you're going to have a conflict. You'll have to wait until that is released. Um, Another thing that that needs to be under uh, that is good to, under, to 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 know what happens is, let's say you have a um, access share log, um, and then which which is something you might get when you're uh, reading from a table. And there's a lot of workers reading from a table, and you want to make a change to the table. Uh, let's say add a column. So you need to take out an access exclusive log. What happens is that you get put, this access uh, exclusive um, request gets put in a queue. All the other uh, log requests on that resource go through first and they need to be completed before your access exclusive is, is granted, which makes sense. Uh, but it also means that any other requests that are coming behind you in a queue, in a queue are waiting for your access exclusive to be granted and released. So, uh, modifying a table schema on a busy uh, on a busy table can actually be quite disruptive, just because of that uh, of that effect where everything else behind is queued behind the access of ex access exclusive log. Um, and if there is a long running transaction that is that isn't doesn't want to release that. Uh, that shared log for a long time, it has an effect of basically serializing all the all the input. Everything has to wait. So this, uh, so now let's go into the structure of a log manager. Typically, when uh, people talk about a Postgres log manager, they talk about a log table. It is this part here. There's a structure in a shared memory that contains a um, that contains a hash table for each um, pass, uh, for each uh, for each database object that has logs against it. Um, by its uh, OID, you have a list of logs that are taken out against this table. <coughs> uh, that logs against this object. Uh, so this is where where this typically lives. However, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more resources. There's a lot more mechanisms involved in this, and this is this doesn't represent all of 
the possibilities because I couldn't figure out how to put it all on one slide. So in addition to that table, you also have a proclock structure, which is similar to the table above, but it also includes which process ID it has taken out uh, logs against these uh, against this object. Then each backend, which would be uh, which would be a um, which 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 would have its own process ID, has its own local log structure. I just love the uh, the naming convention, uh, which is by the way straight from the source code. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So each backend keeps track of the logs that it has and the logs that it's requesting. Um, in addition to that, you also have a, what's called a fast path, fast path mechanism, which allows the backend to just say, I'm gonna trust that I can take this log out and I'm gonna do it without telling anybody, kind of. Uh, what it means is that a backend is allowed to take a certain amount of low uh, conflict probability logs on its own. Uh, so these are logs that are not likely to conflict. Uh, backend also has the capability of, if it uh, has a log and it needs, it's done with it, but it knows that it's going to request it right away, it'll just keep it for longer. Uh, there's also mechanisms for one backend to recognize that another one has a fast path lock and force it to be promoted, which then forces the original backend to figure out that its lock has been promoted, uh, moved moved out of the uh, moved out of the way, uh, and and it, it's no longer in in its own ownership. It has to be looked up in a shared memory. So uh, the point of the slide is there is far more complexity than just a simple um, table in memory. And really that's, that's, that's the main takeaway. So um, at this point, that kind of gives us the background overview of what logs are, why they exist, and why they're used. Um, are there any questions at this point? Um, not as of yet. I do not believe so, unless I'm missing something. Why don't we get through this section and then I'm sure questions will pop up. All right. Sounds good. Let's, uh, let's keep going because we're getting into the exciting and fun part. So, um, oh, I should probably mention that, um, uh, I should address the gorilla in the room. Uh, so. My spirit animal, I chose to be a silverback gorilla, and I had way too much fun creating these images. Um, so I inflict them onto you. Um, so regular logs. Uh, so this is how the database decides who can access and or modify any specific uh, database object. So we had a lot of theory. Let's go to let's get to the fun part. Let's talk about a case study. So case study number one is inheritance. So this is the old style way of uh, uh, doing uh, uh, table partitioning. When you have a parent table and you have a given number of child tables that inherit from it, it uh, follows closely with the open source um, uh, with the open source. Um, uh, not open source, sorry, with the programming uh, uh, object model. So, um, so problem. When you have a query that executes against the parent table that needs to access every, uh, every single child, what happens is that that query will then generate a lock against every single child table because it'll execute, it'll try to execute against all the children simultaneously. Uh, each child table might then have a 
index that can, that needs to be logged or a toast table. Um, and if you have, let's say, a thousand children, the number of logs that is being managed by Postgres can actually increase drastically. Does that have an effect? Turns out it does. Uh, so this is from an experiment that I performed um, in, my, uh, in my system on my own. Uh, a little bit about this experiment because I like to be uh, precise. Uh, so this is a, uh, a database, um, it's uh, Postgres 16. It is um, a parent table with 40 million entries big enough to be interesting. Uh, I vary the number of partitions from 100 to 10,000. Uh, data is uniformly distributed ac across all child partitions. Uh, tables are vacuumed and analyzed before each run. Database ends up being about eight gigabytes in size. Uh, in this case, the database is running from a RAM disk of about 16 gigabytes, so there's plenty of, uh, of space, and then additionally shared buffers is another eight gigs. So uh, everything fits very well in RAM. There's no, there's no IO generated. Uh, we're executing a fixed workload in each case with 20 clients and four threads for about 60 seconds for each case, and then measuring the average number of active logs at any given time. So as you can see here, uh, there's no difference between read or read-write workload. And you have a sharp increase as uh, uh, until you reach a peak and then a slow uh, spiral of uh, doom uh, or slope of doom. Uh, as you increase the number of partitions, the number of transactions per second that, that can, that can, be, uh, can be satisfied can be completed is decreasing. Um, in On my system, in the in this system, the peak performance occurred just over 8,000 uh, 8, locks being managed at any given time. Uh, but in reality, you would probably start seeing performance problems somewhere around 20,000. So at 20,000, you're likely to realize that um, my performance isn't doing so well. Um, all right, so that's 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 basically basically it. The uh, uh, this seems to support that as you're uh, increasing the number of logs that are being managed at any given time, then the performance uh, does suffer. So what happens when you have um, a uh, a native partition table like this. Well, one way is to so, uh, is to um, convert it to native partitioning, which is a lot more, um, um, a lot better at handling logs. Um, and uh, the um, uh, Postgres is more able to figure to a better fig better able to figure out um, which table needs to be accessed and logged and 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 manage it a lot more sanely. Here is a method that we that I like to um, that I've used successfully, and it works really, really well because it doesn't require a um, copy of all the data. Um, so we start by taking the parent table and moving renaming it out of the way. Then we create a copy of the power, power of the parent table with partitioning, in this case by range. For this to work. We need to make sure that whatever we use for the partition key is part of the primary key. It, ha it cannot be null. Um, and then for each child table, we remove it from the inheritance and then we attach it to the new inheritance and we drop the old one. So all the work happens at the metadata level of the tables. Um, you do need to have uh, exclusive logs on all the objects involved because we're renaming the parent table, we're creating new ones, we're taking all the all the children and moving them around. So all of those would would require exclusive logs. 
Um, and how well does it work? It works pretty well. You can take a very large table with, let's say, 1,000 children and in about one or two to two minutes uh, convert uh, everything into the new format. Um, there are a few caveats. Um, you need to make sure that uh, at least 80%, the rule of thumb is about 80% of your queries have to have the partition key as part of the uh, filter on the queries. Otherwise, you don't really gain anything because if you don't, if your query doesn't use the partition key, then it'll execute against all the child tables. And a second one, which may or may not be um, very important or could be uh, a showstopper, is that the partition key has to be part of the primary key which means that you lose the ability to enforce certain types of uniqueness. Let's say you need to have a unique ID. In this case, you, you, you would need to add the, if the partition key is a date, you would need to add the date into the primary key. So you no, so you no longer have a, um, uh, you cannot really, it, it's a lot more difficult to enforce a uniqueness constraint. So let's say we convert it to native partitioning. Uh, life is good. Performance goes. Uh, uh, performance improves. We don't. We don't manage uh, fifty or sixty thousand logs anymore. Um, let's talk a little bit about cleanup and archiving. Um, so at some point when you have a partition table, usually you will you would want to perform some kind of a maintenance task. Uh, maybe you don't need to keep uh, the last 10 years of history in your table. You just you want to archive the old stuff, but only keep the last two years. A lot of times what happens is uh, people just focus on the um, on this method here, which is uh, detach the partitions that you don't need. Um, and then move them out of the way, or archive them, or copy them, copy them, copy them away. And this is definitely one of the methods. I would like to present two more for your consideration. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at the uh, deleting records. Typically, people shy away from that because it is slow, it is high I/O, and it can result in uh, or can result in uh, in table bloat because those records get deleted. They need to be cleaned up, vacuumed. Uh, releasing disk space may be, may be problematic. However, it is a method that should be considered because it doesn't take any locks on the on the tables. It doesn't take any lock on the parent table. It just it if you can make it work slowly in the background, it'll just do its thing, complete. Um, and then you can move on. Then, as we mentioned, detaching partitions, it's also, uh, it's also uh, great. You can, it's fast, uh, but it does require an exclusive lock on a parent, which, as I mentioned before, it can cause uh, congestion problems uh, as that uh, uh, exclusive lock is in the uh, queue to be granted. All the work behind is, is piling up. Um, on a really busy database with long-running transactions, it may be very difficult to do this in a kind of automatic way. So you, you need to use a lock timeout to fail gracefully. Try again. Um, in that case, uh, a third option, which might be to truncate the partition. If you just need the space on an emergency basis or need to uh, need to release the space for a new partition, um, truncating a child partition doesn't take a lock on the it doesn't take an ex uh, exclusive lock on the parent table. You can reclaim the space, detach at some at some future future point when you're able to get the lock. So to present the first option, I want to go through the, through the rest of them. The, the other ones are pretty simple, but to present the first option of how you might want to delete uh, records in a um, kind of a nice way from a database, from a database table. Um, one way that, that I like to do is to create a procedure. 
Uh, in this speci specific procedure, we are re deleting records. Uh, we pass in two parameters, uh, the limit, which is um, how many, um, uh, how many uh, deletes we're going to do in a single batch, and then sleep, which is how long we're going to sleep in between batches. Um, there's two, um, two phases. One is for each, um, for each batch, we first generate a list of IDs. You may want to order them if, if that makes sense for your table. But we generate list of IDs and we put them into a variable. Um, if uh, if the list of IDs is um, uh, is null, then uh, um, there's no work to be done and we can exit. Then we execute our payload, which is in this case delete. You can include an archiving step, copy it over out into an archiving table. We execute a delete, we commit it. This, this part happens in a transaction. Um, and then we perform our sleep. Uh, the nice thing about this is it just goes in, it slowly will, will delete it in batches, it will keep going. Um, it doesn't generate a big overriding transaction for the entire process. It's just the transaction happens in this step over here. So you don't have a, the problems that we will um, look into a little bit later when you have really long long running transactions, um, keeping um, keeping other transactions visibility rules uh, alive. Um, so I find that sometimes slow and steady, let it run, um, is a is a great way to kind of make a background task that that that, that does a cleanup every now and then. So, <clears throat> uh, let's close up this section about regular logs with a little bit about investigating them. Um, so, when we had that big table with all those X's on the screen, um, that's one way of viewing at the logs uh, and their interactions. And it's great if you're a developer. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I like to see what my queries are asking or what the problems might be happening. Uh, so we, I have uh, written this query over here, which all it does is um, for, uh, for a given specific query, it will display what kind of uh, object and what kind of logs are taken against it. Um, now, I would like to be uh, uh, I'd like to be kind of clear. This part, feel free to run it in a in a uh, in a production environment if you if you're experiencing problems. You can modify the uh, this section of the uh, query filter to uh, find the logs that are happening against a. Uh, against uh, the the works, uh, logs that are generated for a specific uh, for a specific uh, query that you're investigating. This part I would not run in production. What this does, what this allows you to do is, uh, if you execute it in a um, separate uh, separate session, it allows you to execute your query and then find what logs are being taken against it. This is great to run in a test environment. Uh, however, running it in production means that those logs are actually taken out and all of your other clients and users of this database are waiting for those logs to be released while you're uh, examining the output. Here's an example of, a, of an output. Uh, this, speci this specific output is for a truncating of a table that cascades to a, to a reference table uh, so it's a truncate on a tax table um, that then uh, cascades into the post tax table with its own primary keys. So you can see how um, uh, exclusive logs can propagate from a sim from a simple query. So a little bit more about monitoring, uh, not from the point of view of actually. Um, doing, but kind of like what questions you may want to ask. Um, so first of all, um, configuration, what is important from, for monitoring logs? Uh, 
log 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 weights. Um, it's uh, whether you're going to display uh, display any log um, any transactions that are waiting for logs more than a deadlock timeout uh, for for more, for more than a deadlock timeout amount of time. Uh, max logs per transaction. That uh, variable um, controls how large the uh, log table is in memory. It's not quite that simple because uh, the calculation involves uh, uh, max connections and involves how many prepared transactions there might be. But it's uh, it's one of the main components how you how you would increase the size of the table. And then uh, uh, log timeout. It's very useful in your own script. If you're uh, executing kind of a job uh, in a, in a cron job, you may want to include lock timeout to make sure that you fail gracefully instead of waiting for for a very long time for a lock. If you're examining lock, if you're monitoring locks in real time, then obviously you want to look at PG logs, PG start activity. We'll be going into into that a little bit more, and then uh, you've got a, a PG blocking PIDs. You can investigate. What is locking a given process, a given back uh, backend process uh, by by its PID? So, what is blocking it, or what will be blocking it in the future? So, this will also return the um, other PIDs that have uh, locks in the queue that are ahead of this one. So, they're not blocking yet, but they will be, which is kind of interesting. And when you're looking at monitoring, uh, on your, or you need to investigate uh, monitoring, these are the kind of the questions that I find useful. So, um, which transaction is being blocked? Obviously, that's uh, that, that's important. Uh, which transaction is doing the blocking? Uh, which objects are locked the most? This is a useful uh, metric if you're able to 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 get it to get a statistical information about uh, um, about um, uh, which objects, uh, which tables um, are generating the most contention in your in your database. Uh, which logs is this table trying? Uh, which logs is this query trying to acquire? Which I just showed an example of how to um, how to uh, how to how to get that. And a good metric to keep track of is um, which uh, uh, what is the average waiting time for a log? Okay, so uh, that is the section about the regular logs. Uh, do we have any questions at this at this time? We sure do. Um, so the first question is, what are the implications of using no inherit on performance and execution plan section for queries on parent table? Uh, so no inherit will. Uh, take the uh, child table and it'll remove its inheritance. Uh, let's see if I can go back to that slide. Um, here. Nope, that wasn't it. Right. Um, so we would execute this in a transaction, which means that. Um, it happens as, as an atomic unit. Um, for every child table, we would uh, remove the existing inheritance. So what this does is modifies the uh, metadata of this child table and, and removes it for, from, the, uh, um, from the old style par uh, uh, partitioning scheme and just says this is now a regular table. And in the next step, we're attaching it to the new partitioning table that we created here. So the implication is that it does take an exclusive log, but we're already doing pretty, uh, uh, like this would require an exclusive log. This will require an exclusive log because you're modifying the table structure. 
Uh, however, as we do this in a single transaction, the log persists. Does that answer the question? I'd say so. Um, another one that's come in. Can you clarify on any major differences for lock management across PostgreSQL versions? Um, yes. Uh, so this is a large topic in itself. I don't know how we're able to get get uh, get into uh, into too much of that, but yes, there are differences in uh, uh, in locks in and how they're how they're managed. There isn't maybe as um, so in the older older versions like version nine, the only option was to have the um, native uh, not native the uh, inheritance partition. Native partitioning definitely makes things better. Uh, as long as your queries follow the right format, they, they use the right the right filter. Uh, over time, the uh, with the newer versions, the logs the log manager is improved, uh, both in um, how uh, Postgres is managing the queries um, and how um, uh, like when the logs are propagated. Uh, what, uh, sometimes um, uh, there's changes going through the source code. That will um, modify a given a given background process to allow it to take a, a lower level lock. So there's always a lot of changes, but in some ways the actual lock manager code has remained remarkably uh, stable. Um, I guess the the answer is there's a lot of changes, and it depends. But it's all a big topic in in its own, and it, it typically requires a lot of research, uh, because Lock Manager is involved in so many different parts of Postgres, and we'll go a little bit into that in in the rest of this conversation. Great, and one more question for the time being: What are advisory locks? Uh, so advisory locks are, I actually kind of find them cool. They're uh, a little bit out of scope of this conversation. Um, I like to think of it as Postgres um, locking a number. They make sense from the application perspective. Um, think from the point of view of running an application that is running on a cluster. You've got an application cluster and you have a resource, uh, a shared resource that you want um, to manage the access to. Uh, as an example, um, uh, there's a, a software called Moodle that uh, um, uh, there is a cron job that needs to execute every uh, every few minutes that that, that uh, actually sends out emails and performs some maintenance. Uh, one way of uh, dealing with this problem is uh, to make sure you have one node that is running as the master and it's always executing that job. Another way is to make sure that um, if a if this maintenance job has not run in five minutes, any any of the nodes can go in and uh, execute the scrum job. Um, that may not work very well if two nodes will choose to execute at the same time. So you would actually, you could create an advisory log in Postgres and basically lock it for an execution. So. It's something that just makes sense from the application perspective. Wonderful. All right. I think that's all we got for the moment. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's go back to where we were. Lightweight locks. <clears throat> so case study number three, subtransactions. Uh, Subtransactions allow us to roll back part of a transaction um, or uh, to create safe points that you can, actually that, that's basically it. You're, you're allowed to, instead of the, the entire transaction being all or nothing, you can have subsections that can execute or fail. Uh, there is a few caveats. If the main transaction is rolled back, then all the subtransactions have to be rolled back. Um, and But any single subtransaction uh, doesn't actually uh, necessarily mean that the main transaction has to fail. These happen automatically, especially if you use ORMs. Um, anytime you execute uh, a code with an exception, it actually performs it as a subtransaction. And then anytime you use safe points, 
and they generate subtransactions as well. Um, from the perspective of, of, a, um, of a lock manager, there can be a few ways that this, uh, things can go wrong. One is the, uh, uh, obviously, every subtransaction has, its, has to have its own ID. Uh, which means that there is now suddenly a lot more uh, transaction IDs that need to be managed. Um, they also, they're not independent IDs. There is a specific structure. There is a parent transaction and then any number of sub-transactions that have to be linked. So in, uh, and that, uh, that have to allow specific behavior of um, rolling back of this one versus rolling back of that one actually cascading down, uh, rolling back of the uh, parent one uh, actually cascades down. Um, so um, that's obviously the, the first problem is the, the number of transactions has now has now increased and managing them is uh, difficult. Uh, or managing is, is an extra overhead. So we'll start with uh, multi-transaction IDs. So whenever you have a, a transaction or sub-transaction, so you actually generate a multi-transaction IDs. These are, um, uh, these obviously have an impact on the visibility. Uh, the main part that I wanna go, go into here is that you have something called a multi-transaction ID store that contains a list of multi-transactions that, uh, that, that, are, that are active at, uh, at any given time. Now, a multi-transaction store uh, would contain a parent transaction and a uh, immutable set of ch child transactions. That's a lot of uh, words, but what it means is that uh, kind of like a, a Postgres table, when you add a new sub-transaction to an active list, you make a copy and you create a new row. <clears throat> Multi-transaction store is stored partially on a disk. And uh, the other part that is important to note is that multi access to multi-transaction store is controlled by a single global lightweight lock. What that means is that when you have a lot of these transactions, um, this uh, this table this uh, uh, this multi transaction uh, store is uh, can grow very very large. Uh, access to it can be slow to try to find the uh, the transaction and the sub transactions you're looking for, and it's all serialized behind a single lightweight lock, which can be slow. Um, and we will see some examples of uh, how to see this kind of access and this kind of problem. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, okay, really that's, uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the multi-transaction store, if you're interested, is stored in the PG multi exact, uh, directory. So if you want to see how, how big those files can get, uh, especially if you're not allowed, if you don't have, um, out of vacuum running to kind of clean things up. Next thing, it's uh, also staying back on the topic of multi-transactions. This is another kind of interesting issue that can uh, show up, uh, which is um, fun to diagnose. So let's do a setup. We've got a, a master, a primary server that is replicating to a standby. Uh, you're, you're allowing uh, read-only queries on a standby and then you're using hints. Um, you have um, a small, doesn't have to be that large uh, rate of a uh, multi-transactions happening on the primary. And you have a long running transaction running on a primary. After a little while, it kind of depends on the rate of transactions. What happens is the standby performance drops to something like 10% of what it used to be. You start looking on the standby, trying to see what's going wrong, and you can't really see anything. The reason you can't really see 
what is going wrong is because the problem is actually on the primary. What happens is uh, we, we end up in a condition called SLRU, which stands for a simple least recently used. Um, so uh, SLRU overflow. Each backend advertise its uh, buffer, a buffer of uh, transactions and logs and uh, of active logs. It's only about, I think, 64, uh, 64 entries. So if you go beyond that, which can happen if your uh, your uh, primary is now tracking um, uh, more, if there's a long running transaction that doesn't allow the multi transactions to be to be cleaned up. That list uh, uh, that list just keeps growing, um, and uh, you overflow this kind of uh, little scratch pad that tells you what is what is active, uh, which is no problem, no, no data loss. But now the check to uh, for every new transaction, there has to be the, uh, performed a check to see what other transactions might might be having logs on the objects you're trying to look at. Now the check has to go to the main table. It cannot be cannot happen very quickly. It goes through uh, a different set of a set of logs uh, accessing the the main log table inside of the uh, inside of the main process, which is a lot slower. That table is also increasing. Um, there is a performance impact on the primary, but it's really visible on a standby. Uh, things really things go really really slow as each new transaction is trying to figuring out what it can and cannot see and can cannot access in an ever growing uh, list of uh, uh, list of logs. Uh, just go sorry, go back a little bit. The solution um, in in an emergency kill the long running transaction on the primary and things go back to normal almost within a second or two. So lightweight locks. Um, they're typically used to access shared memory structures instead of Postgres. They are used internally by uh, one bit of Postgres talking to another. Uh, they're useful to understand uh, which resource is busy um, they have pre-descriptive names. Um, you can see if uh, writing to a wall file is a bottleneck or if access, accessing a shared buffer. Uh, there is no deadlock detection on lightweight locks. Under normal conditions, uh, you wouldn't see uh, a lot of lightweight locks in the uh, in the PDStat activity table. That's pr pretty much the, uh, the, on, uh, the main way where you can see it. Um, if there's no contention, um, accessing uh, or sort of obtaining or releasing a lightweight log is generally done in a few dozen CPU instructions. So it is um, uh, it is very very fast, and they don't uh, they don't have any timeouts. So they'll just keep waiting until they get the log that, that they request. So looking at PG Star activity table and what information you can get out of it about lightweight logs, um, I actually uh, took the advantage and I uh, included regular logs in here as well, but I split them in a um, kind of a, what I find a more useful, uh, more useful way. So going back a little bit about regular, regular logs, um, if, you're, uh, if your queries or your database or a large number of queries are waiting for uh, either client extension IO uh, IPC stands for interprocess communications or for a timeout. Uh, that means that this backend is waiting for something. They're waiting for the client to to read or finish a connection. They're waiting for the IO operation to complete. Uh, the important thing about this list is that uh, these weights, these logs, are affecting that specific query and that specific query only. Uh, there may be a lot of them if, let's say, uh, there's a lot of them are waiting for I.O., but it will, it will, it, the scope is that individual query, which is kind of useful to know. Um, if you are routinely spending a lot of time in this, that typically means that uh, you have some kind of a resource starvation. 
For I.O. means you might want to consider faster disk. For client, maybe you need to figure out, uh, maybe your application is uh, hanging on to the uh, connections file. It, it doesn't uh, release the connections quickly enough. Uh, it hangs, hangs on to them. So you get, uh, you get a, lot of, uh, a lot of left in that state. Um, extension, uh, we'll go through it in just a second. Um, time outs, um, basically increasing resources may be an answer when you hear, when you see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, queries in this state for locking on the right side. Uh, so, uh, uh locking on a buffer pin on a LW lock, uh, or, or, an, or a regular lock, this often uh, represents a, a kind of a structure problem or a workload problem. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, adding more resources may not actually resolve the issue because it is something with how the uh, uh, how the how the access uh, access to data happens. How the what's the pattern of accesses? Uh, so you may need to look look at uh, in that direction. And you notice that extension is in both because it depends. It de uh, in some cases the uh, I mean extension is a separate piece of code. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, information from Postgres level as to what is actually happening in the extension. So you may actually uh, have to resort to looking up the source code for it and figuring out what happens manually. And then for a specific type of uh, lightweight logs, you can have, uh, um, you can have um, any number of events which are pretty descriptive. Um, so you can see whether you're waiting for a log manager. So you're accessing data structures inside of the log manager. Um, Cause at this point we're in a lightweight log event. So we know that it is one bit of Postgres talking to another. Um, for wall, uh, you're trying to uh, write to the wall file uh, or access the, the buffers, or as we have seen a couple of slides prior, uh, accessing the multi-transaction store. And there is others in the uh, in the documentation, so you can you can look that look that up. So takeaways. Um, I really didn't want this uh, this uh, presentation to be um, about bashing the log manager. I do think the log manager is awesome. It is complex. Uh, in a vast, vast majority of the situations, Log Manager works really, really well. Uh, we um, only see problems when uh, the pattern of accesses or something goes wrong and we degenerate into a non-optimized uh, situation. When the uh, multi-transaction store or when the SLU, SLRU um, overflows, and we have to use the uh, more robust but much slower method to figure figure out what's what's going on. Um, so it is a very complex, and I, I hope that came across in this conversation. Um, but it is also a really really well designed and well working system most of the time. However, because logs are meant to be brief, quick, and you cannot really add a lot of mechanism for monitoring because of the overhead involved with that, problems may be difficult to diagnose. Um, I'm including a little slide about uh, various resources. Um, so, I don't know that I really want to go too much into into here other than um, if you have problems or if you suspect you have problems or just are interested, don't be afraid to look at the Postgres documentation and specifically the source code. I am uh, repeatedly surprised by the level of documentation uh, and the notes inside of the uh, inside of the uh, Postgres source code. There are big sections of text that, even if you, if you're not familiar with how to read C, 
uh, you're able to get a good idea as to what uh, as to how things work in much greater detail than than what's available in the documentation. So it is well worth um, keeping that in uh, in mind when you're trying to diagnose a problem. And uh, then uh, there's a few other tools and uh, um, and uh, and documentation. There's a PG log tracer, which is here, which is a very interesting tool that is capable of collecting statistics about the, about the log usage. Um, there's a PG Center, which is kind of like a top uh, Linux top for Postgres. And there is a couple of uh, um, ways that you could monitor um, lightweight logs by using um, at this point, you're basically going into the realm of uh, kernel monitoring and setting up a, uh, traps on a given function calls. So this is uh, I probably a, a conversation or maybe presentation at some a later date uh, because it's a huge topic all, all, all on its own. All right, and having said that, are there any kind of final questions? Yes, we have three questions as it stands right now, um, and we probably have time to do up to five. So if y'all want to get some questions in, now is the time to do it. Next question then, is it possible to get more visibility into lightweight locks and what is happening right now? Um, right, so yes and no, lightweight locks are extremely short-lived. Um, they are, um, uh, it's difficult to see what, what's happening because they're meant to be satisfied within a couple dozen CPU instructions. So adding any kind of uh, monitoring on top is, uh, is nearly impossible, not without uh, causing a lot of potential problems. Um, and as I mentioned be, uh, before, if you want to monitor uh, where that happens and how that ha happens, you're basically uh, you can look at the uh, perf uh, lin something in the Linux system. Perf top will tell you what kind of functions uh, are being executed and and how frequently they're called. Or you can do something like um, uh, uh, perf record and reports to try to debug the Postgres process as it's running and set traps on the given functions, which will uh, which you can f look up as to which. Uh, uh, which process, uh, sort of which, uh, which component of Postgres is actually, uh, and what what it might be doing, how often it might be might be called, and how long it takes for it to execute. But it, this is really uh, one you're probably not going to have this capability on your production system, um, and it is uh, not for. Uh, uh, it is a very complex mechanism that is designed for kernel developers. So approach carefully is would be my advice. Great, thank you. And one final question before we wrap up. How do background processes in PostgreSQL interact with the lock manager? So a background process is um, same like, like, any, uh, like any other process. Uh, except it is written by Postgres developers. So they typically are really good at uh, trying to take the least amount of logs and work with them in a, uh, in a responsible manner. Uh, so uh, vacuums, um, uh, as an example, uh, a vacuum will take the least amount of logs and it'll actually, uh, the, the typical out of vacuum that's, that's generated will go to sleep, will, will try to release the logs, uh, whenever possible, and uh, make sure that it doesn't generate too much I/O. Um, for a vacuum that you that you execute from a command line, it's more aggressive. Um, it may not uh, may not go to sleep. Um, if you do something like vacuuming the entire uh, the entire database, it can actually generate a full long running transactions with its own problems, uh, like we just like we discussed prior. Uh, so. In short, uh, the background processes, uh, they can cause problems. They should definitely be looked at. Um, uh, they are 
often some of those transactions that do execute for, for a very long time, even an analyze on an entire table can take um, eight hours just because it's locked and released and keeps going in little, little spurs, um, depending on how busy the, the, uh, the database is. Okay, wonderful. Um, those are all the questions we have. So I think we're good to wrap up. Most importantly, Greg, thank you so much. Um, that was a bear of a deck and you got through it. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone who's still here with us and everyone who joined us today. Um, regardless of where you are, I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening. Um, and I hope to see you on future Postgres conference webinars. Thanks, y'all.